Normally shy and elusive, the mountain lions and bobcats living near Tucson are being stalked by a new kind of paparazzi from the University of Arizona. This is part of a project in which we were um, monitoring mountain lions and bobcats in the Tucson mountains. And we're, as biologists, we're worried a little bit about those two species, especially mountain lions in the Tucson mountains, because the mountain range is surrounded by sprawl and urbanization and the interstate as well of our, as our Central Arizona project uh, water canal or aqueduct. So essentially the mountain is becoming an island in, in a sea of development. This project is one arm of the University of Arizona's School of Natural Resources and the Environment. It's aptly named the Wildcat Research Conservation Program and eventually its reach will extend far beyond Southern Arizona. What we here at University of Arizona are creating is an international program, of, and this is one piece of it, which is essentially um, a pyramid. So at the very top of the pyramid is our mission is the conservation of the world's 36 species of wild cats. And in order to facilitate that, we need students and biologists and conservationists, preferably from their home countries, to study and conserve the wild cats of the world. The addition of wildcat specialist Jim Sanderson as a member of the project team will help facilitate the involvement of international biology students. I've been working with a lot of really good students around the world on wildcat projects. Uh, these students are very good, sometimes the best, uh, the best there are in their countries, and these students are very talented. Uh, they speak English perfectly, and I'd like to get them into graduate programs where we can oversee them and help them do their research and continue their, to do what they're doing to conserve wildlife in their own countries. So at the base of the pyramid, here in Tucson at University of Arizona, which is home to the University of Arizona Wildcats, is two aspects. One of those is uh, local research that's actually answering specific management questions here in the Tucson area. What Lisa is finding that is that uh, there's an awful lot of wildlife in and around Tucson uh, living with people and most often people don't even see the wildlife that's here. So the wildlife has uh, adapted to living around people and uh, they avoid people. So the camera traps allow us to look at how animals change their behavior when they live around people. And that's very difficult data to collect without camera traps. The Wildcat program has deployed 65 infrared triggered cameras in the Tucson mountains and surrounding wildlife corridors. Volunteers check the cameras regularly and have collected over 12,000 images during the past two years. Since anything that crosses the camera's beam will trigger a photo, everything from coyotes to curious deer, raccoons to roadrunners have had their pictures taken. And what is the most photographed species? humans, who probably never realized they were sharing the trails with so much wildlife. Major funding for this program was provided by Arizona Game and Fish through its Heritage Fund grants as well as Pima County. There's very little chance of, of a person or human interaction with pumas because they avoid people. And we can see by comparing the camera trap information gathered here in Tucson with camera trap information available elsewhere where there are no people, that the animals are probably changing their behavior to live more comfortably with people and avoid human wildlife conflicts. The third side of the Wildcat Program's pyramid involves local public outreach and by engaging citizen scientists in the Backyard Bobcat Program. Residents are being encouraged to upload their own photos to the project's website of bobcats they've found on their property. Researchers can use that information to map the distribution of bobcats across the Tucson Basin. Seeing these wild animals should be a regular part of our lives, but we, because we spend most of our time in offices inside, 
we're actually distancing ourselves from the natural world. And people are lucky here in the Southwest to be able to see wildlife right outside their backyards. And that's why Lisa called it the Backyard Bobcat Program. We can see wildlife here and we're very fortunate uh, to see these kinds of animals, particularly predators that are often so very difficult to see. And as I said, people never forget seeing them. And once they see it, once they make that connection, they never forget it. They want to protect these animals as best they can. And then we also have been examining gene flow across the landscape. Again, that's one of the major concerns for these wild felids, not only here in Tucson, but around the world, is do we have gene flow across the landscape? So we used genetic techniques uh, to look at bobcat gene flow across the Tucson Basin. Some of the genetic work being done requires the biologists to look far beyond just photography. Since it's almost impossible to differentiate between one mountain lion and another from a photograph, researchers in the field collect physical samples whenever possible for further study in the lab. While the field biologists are out monitoring the cameras, it's very easy to opportunistically collect scat hair, even snippets of, of tissue from carcass or bones, other um, remnants of animal remains that can be found out in the desert. So those can come back to the lab and we can extract DNA. And the amount of information we can get from that DNA is um, almost limitless. From the genotypes, we can look at whether samples collected in one area are of the same connected population to another area, or if, if two populations are fairly well separated. And if they're separated, you know, what is the cause of that separation? Could it be development, you know, some of our urban development or our highways? Um, or natural barriers. So those are just some of the things that we can start looking at with, with these genetic markers. Mountain lions may have a home range of anywhere from 30 to 120 square miles. So working with urban planners, alternative energy developers, as well as transportation managers to help keep wildlife corridors open is paramount to their survival. It's a message that the Wildcat program plans to take worldwide. The bottom line for us is not so much research, it's conservation. The research will come out of a conservation motivated program. We want to conserve these animals and the more we learn about them, the more we become fascinated by them, the more questions are raised and this motivates more research. And we want to get outcomes from our research that better help us to understand and manage these animals that live around us and to avoid human wildlife conflicts as best we can.